Welcome to Barnstable Today. I'm Nick Cortez. And I'm Kevin Friel. We'd like to remind you right at the top that the meetings we cover are available on demand at the town's website. You can find them at www.town.barnstable.ma.us. Today we bring you part two of last Thursday's CFAC Sewer Subcommittee presentation to the Town Council regarding alternate financing options for sewer expansion projects. Today's highlights delve into the Council discussion that followed Subcommittee Chairman Bob C. Olick's presentation. We begin with comments from Precinct 1 Councillor Ann Kennedy, the first to speak after the presentation concluded. As you'll see, Councillor Kennedy isn't thrilled about the subcommittee's recommendation that sewer expansion costs should be spread broadly across the entire town. So I understand your recommendation that the entire town pay for it and your characterization that it's a fair way to do it. But I have to bring up the fact that um, by this report and by everything I've heard from the town, we will not, there won't be any consideration, there has been no consideration whatsoever of West Barnesville and Barnesville in any wastewater management plan. And there won't be, for probably 40 years, that's optimistic, out. I'll be 102, my daughter will be 70. Um, that's a long time to ask the people in Bar the north side to pay for um, a benefit that um, cannot be tangibly actually um, realized other than a um, kind of, an, as you quoted Roosevelt, kind of a New Deal um, ideal of, of one community for all. I mean, by the time we got, you got around to paying for sewage on the other other side, everybody else will be sewered and everybody will go, well, hey, we don't have to pay taxes anymore to pay for that side. So I don't know that it's fair. Later, Precinct 7 Councilor Richard Berry openly disagreed with Councilor Kennedy's perspective, believing instead in a more united approach to the sewer problem, perhaps for fear of what's to come if a solution isn't reached. What you need to realize is we are the town of Barnstable. And the bottom line is, you know, I can make the arguments out in Katua that you, we don't have a full-time police officer, we don't have a school out there, all these things. But the bottom line is, we are the town of Barnstable. Now, I think this document that you guys put together is great, just plain and simple. I almost welcome a lawsuit in this thing because this is going to get kicked around and everyone's going to be the bad guy and Ann Kennedy's going to be bad because she said, well, the people on the north side shouldn't pay for it and the people over in Ketuit and Osterville are, are going to reap the benefits and this thing's going to get kicked around forever. <laughs> and the only way I think it's really truly going to get resolved is a federal court judge saying, town of Barnstable, not village of Barnstable or village of Ketuit or anyone else, town of Barnstable. This is what you folks are going to do, and that's what's going to happen. So I think we need to keep our eye on it's going to be whomever versus the town of Barnstable. And we have to think that way to come up with a comprehensive solution to this problem. While Councillor Barry acknowledged the likelihood of a lawsuit, Precinct 3 Councillor James Munifo took it one step further and queried Subcommittee Chairman Siolik as to the wisdom of accepting that inevitability to see how it would play out. And I think ultimately um, I have to agree with the uh, Councillor from Precinct 7 who suggested that um, we might just be better off if we end up getting sued because um, it just seems that if this is something we have to do and this is another federal and state unfunded mandate and now they're looking at us to come up with the answers and the solutions and the ways to do this and to voluntarily move in um, to this kind of program so that we uh, re remain autonomous I don't know if that financial benefit actually weighs in there and how much more it will actually end up costing in the end because the numbers now are, you know, are insurmountable in these difficult economic times. So uh, finding out the balances and understanding the differences um, after fighting a protracted case uh, in the courts, then um, which, you know, everybody believes will happen. The question is, is whether you have the ability to be able to win a case like that. 
And if we were able to win the case, and even though it would be, uh, you know, a small chance for that to happen, it would be a significant uh, reduction in costs, of course, to the community overall. And would that be something that's worth taking the risk? Having been uh, sued uh, by the federal government and the Conservation Law Foundation, I think I speak with some basis in fact, um, I'm under no illusion at all in terms of how difficult this decision is going to be for the town and the town administration. Um, in a lot of ways, this is a this is a lose lose proposition. Um, and I'm not here to tell you whether or not you're going to get sued. I don't know. I only know what I read in the paper. I cannot tell you whether or not you're in violation of the Clean Water Act, either the federal act or the state act. I'm not sure. Um, but the people that I was involved with uh, 15, 20 years ago were a good group of people who, who cared about doing the right thing, not to mention the fact that one of them is going to be running for president of the United States. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, as much as we wanted to do the right thing, we ended up doing nothing, and we ended up being sued. The end result of being sued was that we lost. We were fined $3 million that were paid for by the ratepayers. There was a moratorium on sewer hookups, which brought economic development to a screeching halt in the, in the Boston metropolitan area. And most important and most problematic and the issue that the town council and the town administration need to think about is the fact that if you're sued and found to be in violation of the law, you will lose control over the strategic decisions associated with the program, the most important one of which is the pace of the program. Throughout the presentation, very little mention was made of the town's most pressing sewer expansion project in the Stewart's Creek neighborhood of Hyannis. That is, until Precinct 12 Councilor John Norman asked the subcommittee for some thoughts as to how to help those residents right away. What, what ideas did you come up with for uh, right now for these folks who are you know, the contracts have been signed, the work is going forward, and what can we do for them in the short term right now? Um, you're right. We did not specifically deal with the Stewart's Creek situation because we couldn't. Uh, because of the pressures of time, it would have distorted the report uh, based on the necessity to make a decision. Um, so there is nothing in the report that specifically deals with that situation. Now, I'm just speak as an individual. It would seem to me that the answer uh, lies pretty much with option two. But the, the trick here is kind of the opposite of what people were saying. I think it will have to be made clear, notwithstanding the fact that you will be running a risk here, that it is indeed not to be seen as a precedent. As we mentioned yesterday, the full CFAC subcommittee report is available for download at the town's website. Just click on the Clean Water Protection Costs link right on the right side of the home page. Now let's take a look at this week's meeting schedule. At 6 p.m., the Airport Commission meets in the Gorley Conference Room. At 6.30 in the evening, the Conservation Commission has a meeting in the Town Hall Hearing Room. Wednesday, March 17th at 7 o'clock, the Hyannis Main Street Waterfront Historic District Committee meets in the Selectman's Conference Room. On Thursday, March 18th, the Town Council meets at 7 o'clock in the Town Hall Hearing Room. Well, that's all the time we have for now. For Kevin Friel, I'm Nick Cortese. We'll see you next time on Barnstable Today.